meticulous, upstanding professional in business attire. That was the IPCC. And then the more I learned about this organization, the more it seemed like a spoiled child to me, that in fact it was full of bravado, it um, had these rules, but it didn't follow the rules, and no one was actually, um, you know, um, giving it any flack or, or pulling it into line. So, so then, and and rather than being very meticulous, it, it, it seemed like it was just a sloppy organization that was, you know, th there are many rules that they're simply not followed. They're down there on paper, and they look very impressive, but no one's enforcing them at the IPCC. And we all know what happens when people get behind the wheel of a car, they will exceed the speed limit, even though there, there's a good chance that the, the cameras are going to catch them or the police are going to catch them. Even when there is enforcement, people don't always follow the rules. When they know there is no enforcement whatsoever, what do we suppose happens? So yeah, that's where the title came from. And it's a very long title. People either love it or they hate it. Um, but my problem was if I put the IPCC in the title, most people have never heard of that organization. So, so I went with the delinquent teenager. Okay, Donna, it's my understanding that uh, several scientists have quit the IPCC. Did you do any uh, correlation to their background and their prominence in the scientific community to see whether or not they were the leading scientists and they've actually left? Um, I didn't. You know, it's, there's some anecdotal evidence, and I think you know there. Are, you could make a good argument that a Richard Lindzen or a P. Uh, uh, Meyer, or pardon me, the the malaria guy, um, who's a, Paul Ryder. Pardon me. I think you can make very good arguments that those people are at the top of their profession, and they've left the IPCC in disgust. But it is anecdotal, and you know part of the problem is people say they're the world's top climate scientists. Well, how do you actually figure that out? And one of the things that's very interesting to know about the IPCC is they announce their authors and they tell you which institution they are associated with, but they don't actually give you their CVs. You can't look at their credentials. There is no easy way to actually verify whether these people are top scientists or not. We just have to take the IPCC's word for it. And the problem is they are not very trustworthy. So. <clears throat> it's uh, hard to believe that this would be organized corruption by government officials. I, I don't think they'd be that organized. Uh, so so it, means, it means that they're awfully inept government officials who are making these decisions and then adopting these policies. They're very inept. So how do you go about fixing this? Uh, you know, it's a big problem. Any ideas how to fix it? It is a big problem. Um, the IPCC is normally f primarily funded by whichever developed country agrees to host the three working groups. So right now, I think that is the US, Germany, and I think Switzerland, because stalkers in Switzerland. So really, the people who have the most influence are the governments that are paying for all the facilities for the three working groups, and those change. So if I wanted to put, you know, if, if I th thought there was anyone who could put pressure on the IPCC individuals to change, it would be the, pardon me, the governments that are doing primarily the funding. But, you know, on the one hand, you can say that the politicians have been snowed by the IPCC. On the other hand, politicians created the IPCC. So it's, you know, it's, it's tough. To, I think it's going to be tough to, to disentangle that. Yes, Donna. Um, the, A, the IPCC will be coming out with AR5 very shortly, within the next year or so. Do you believe that your book and the other publicity, negative publicity that the IPCC is getting is going to affect that report? Or will it be business as usual? Unfortunately, I think it will be business as usual. Um, the other report that I didn't talk about that was very important was the um, Inter-Academy Council investigated the IPCC. And they wrote a rather damning report that came out about 18 months ago in which they concluded that every significant step in the assessment process suffered from serious shortcomings. That was a very damning document. But the IPCC chose to, 
to appoint its AR5 authors nine weeks before that report was released. So it was already underway. All the criticism in that report, the train had already left the station. And there has been no indication that I can see that the IPCC is um, you know, prepared to reform in any significant way. It can't have all those activists as, as you know, leading chapters and expect that we're going to consider it a credible organization. It's just, it doesn't really care. It doesn't seem to care. We have a very apathetic public that doesn't hold their elected officials accountable that allows for a lot of this stuff to go on. What do you think it's going to take? Because it seems to me if the public was standing up and saying, this is ridiculous, why are, we, why are we doing this? Why are we crippling our businesses? Why are we restricting our ability to live our lives fully? It seems to me that if enough people stood up and said, this is ridiculous, why are we doing this? That these policies potentially would reverse themselves or at least they'd be shown to be uh, what do you think it's going to take, though, to get the public engaged in something like this so that you can really see effective change? Well, I think that's a difficult question. The public, I have a lot of sympathy for the public, actually, because most people are just trying to get by. They've got a job, they've got kids, they've got elderly parents, they've got real problems. And um, for 40 years, since Earth Day, they've been told, you know, the sky is falling, the sky is falling. And I think especially with respect to climate change, they're getting tired of hearing it. I think they've just tuned out. And unfortunately, climate change is a very complicated topic. I was surprised when I started researching it how long it took me to sort of get my head around some of the issues. It wasn't something that I could figure out in a few weeks. It took me almost a year of reading lots of stuff on all sides, from all perspectives, to even begin to think that I could speak to this issue in an intelligent way. So the public, you know, doesn't have hours every day to read blogs about the latest climate science news and the latest debates between, you know, the skeptics and, and, and the warmest. So, so, you know, and as I say, I think they've just tuned it out. Um, and I don't blame them. So, you know, what's going to energize the public? I, I'm not sure I know the answer to that. The media seems to be their role, seems to think their role is to sell newspapers or TV uh, news or whatever it is. And you cannot sell things if you say there is no problem. And I think the media is extremely complicit in all of this. Your profession, Donna, uh, is not doing its due diligence and do, doing a good job of reporting what really should be reported. Do you have any comment on that? I agree with you. I'm quite critical of, of you know, journalism as a whole. Um, I think there are a few issues. One of them is that reporters are rushed and they're rushed more than ever these days. So, you know, I've just told you that I've spent a year educating myself before I thought I could say much about this topic. The average reporter doesn't have that time. They just don't. Um, the other thing is that just as there are activists in science, there are activists amongst journalists. And, you know, my idea of a journalist is you should give the public information so the public can make up its own mind, so the public can make an informed decision. But a lot of journalists, unfortunately, and it seems to, you know, have been, happened around the same time that, that, that we got a lot of activists in, in science, we got a lot of activists amongst the journalistic um, core who think that their job is to push a particular pr perspective to help save the world. And you can understand how tantalizing that is. You know, I want to help save the world. I want to give Greenpeace lots of great uh, publicity because, you know, I really believe that, that we're in trouble. And, you know, you can understand how that happens. I don't agree with it. I don't think it's right. But it's one of, it's, you know, it's the real world. And in terms of selling papers, well, it is true that, you know, bad news sells and front pages that say everything's fine, the world's getting better, we have cleaner water and cleaner air, that's not as exciting. And so there is that problem in, with the media. And, and this has been a very difficult time for the media. The last 10 years, advertising revenues have plummeted. They are fighting for their life, a lot of media outlets. 10 years from now, there will be, mark my words, there will be much, many fewer newspapers because they really are having a hard time. So, you know, it's, it's a perfect storm of all sorts of, of concerns. But yes, the media coverage has been disappointing. I would agree with that. 
Uh, well, thank you very much, Donna. Uh, obviously, uh, all of you have been very interested in Donna's address. Uh, we didn't lock the doors. You could have left, but you didn't. Uh, Donna, uh, w your trip to Calgary was a great experience for us. And as a token of our appreciation, we'd like to give you that. And thanks, Donna, again, please.